welcome to Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd and we're so glad you could join us for another great program of gardening tips, even though it's cold and snowy outside. Today we'll be taking a look at making compost and Extension's hops breeding program, as well as a feature on controlling those cedars that could potentially take over, over our prairies. First, we're going to focus on another potential problem with invasive calorie pear trees. They're often planted as ornamentals in our landscape because they seemingly will grow in any soil. And of course, they can be really pretty in the spring with their beautiful white blossoms. But they can also become a problem later as they seed out and start spreading into places where we don't want them. You might wonder why I'm standing next to a rather old and sad decrepit tree in Maxwell Arboretum on campus with a label that says Chanticleer pear. The reason for that is Chanticleer is one of the cultivars of calorie pear, the straight species, and calorie pears have a very interesting and checkered history, and it's getting even more interesting as we look at what is happening with the species. Calorie pears were imported into the United States in the early 1900s to be able to help mitigate some of the huge issues with fire blight. Fire blight, which is a disease that we talk about a lot in members of the rose family, was devastating the actual fruiting pears in this country and, and really wreaking havoc. Calorie pear as a species has greater resistance. So to be able to do the breeding and, and do that crossing of the fruiting pears, which is a different species with calorie, which is more ornamental, built in some fire blight resistance. In the 1950s, what happened is people were looking at all of the different breeding that had been going on. All of a sudden, we have different genotypes appearing from different populations and saw some pretty significant ornamental qualities in calorie pear. That would include beautiful early spring flowers. They flower before the fruit occurs and a, a tendency toward great fall color. So here came one of the very first cultivars of calorie pear, which was the Bradford pear. It was used extensively across the country, a uniform, upright, dense canopy, glossy foliage, disease and insect resistant, great flowering, essentially no fruit because calorie pears, including that original Bradford, are, are pears that cannot self-pollinate. So, so it was essentially sterile for all intents and purposes in the landscape. Here came additional genotypes, additional breeding, and of course with grafting on the rootstock, which is where Bradford uh, originated, it's grafted onto a rootstock. On occasion, what happens is you get damage to the tree itself, and here comes the rootstock, which is straight calorie pear. So all of a sudden, instead of something that is not self-pollinating, we had two things that could cross and of course then create fruit and the fruit, instead of being sterile, could um, become small little seedlings in the landscape. Didn't seem to be much of a problem. Now we have over half the states in the union that have great concern about the invasive qualities of our calorie pear. And what happens with it is the fruits that are produced are relished by the birds and then of course transplanted by those birds and they become these colonies of essentially different calorie type pears. The original calories also can come up with thorns. They're extremely fast growing. They are very difficult to control because if you mow them off, what happens is they actually will come back up from the roots again. The birds continue to spread them. The distance uh, for flying pollinators is about 300 feet. So if you have something that is a different genotype within about 300 feet of another pair, you could end up with seedlings. So we're finding populations even in Lincoln, Nebraska that have spread and become these significant colonies with a fast growth rate. Beware of planting pear. Don't use it as a street tree. Don't use it in your landscape. Choose instead one of our other wonderful early spring flowering plants that so far does not want to threaten to take over the earth. There are plenty of other great options for spring flowers and Midwest hardiness. Serviceberry, plum, redbud or whitebud and dogwood that will offer the same spring flowers but not become a headache as they mature. Alrighty, let's turn our attention to the soil. 
Good soil is the building block to great gardening and really one of the best things you can do for your soil is add organic matter. That means compost. Anybody with a backyard and a little space can make their own compost. For our go-to gardening feature this week, we are going to hear about just exactly how to make compost. We've talked about soil preparation and the use of cover crops, both for soil health and for erosion control, as we help you go garden. This is another great thing you can do, and you can actually start this as soon as you have the energy to do so, and that would be to create your own compost. Compost is one of the fabulous additives that helps improve that soil health, and the beautiful part of this is if you do it correctly, it is absolutely free. It's one of those great sustainable practices. We've done a lot about composting on Backyard Farmer, including how to actually build the compost bins that you see before you, and we have that online. But a couple of things that new gardeners really need to know about this. First off, to be able to get really high quality compost, there is a mix of materials that makes all the difference in the world. That includes something that is carbon-based, and the, the obvious one in the fall of the year is the brown matter that would be all those leaves that are falling on your lawn, that are clogging up your gutters, all those great big beautiful brown leaves. The second is a source of nitrogen, and that is the green material. So it is kitchen waste as long as they are scraps of vegetables and fruits, and as long as they are not too horribly awful or the green waste that is weed materials or the plants that you're cutting back in your garden. And the third is something like soil. So we add soil to it. Now, the thing that happens with compost is the right mix of those materials with the addition of moisture so that they don't dry out will bring that compost to the best possible temperature. If the compost doesn't heat up properly, a couple of things are going to happen. The first of those could be if you've added food scraps and all you've really done is just pile them on top of the compost bin, they're, they're going to deteriorate, but they're also going to smell pretty awful. And if you are a lovely marauding critter, one of Dennis's critters, you just might decide that rather than going off and eating what you should, you're going to go scrounging in the compost bin. The second is if it is too wet, it's going to be really, really soggy and smell terrible. If it's too dry, it's not going to break down at all. You'll see and you'll hear people talk about, and you can actually purchase in a lot of locations, something called a compost accelerator and something called a compost inoculator. Both of those are not necessary if you built your compost pile correctly. The accelerator actually just adds nitrogen. If you have, again, that source of nitrogen that that would be uh, the green materials, you're not going to need the accelerator. If you have a uh, soil that already has those microbes in it, you are unlikely to need an inoculum. But what you wanna do is you wanna make sure, if you really do want to accelerate the, the process of composting, a bin like ours is great because it allows air movement. It is easy to take each piece off, each of, each of the three sections off flip that compost without having to flip the whole thing and introduce air and moisture. And one of the things you can do immediately is rather than put in big old chunks like this, chop them up into finer pieces. So one of the things we'll look at right quick is what happens if you put unchopped leaves, all that brown matter, in a compost pile and just layer things on top of it. Don't wet it. Don't add the green material and don't add all of the soil, they don't break down even after a year and a half. If you chop them up with your mower really, really finely, add them to the compost, you will end up right quick with that black gold that you can then spread on your new garden to wonderful depths to get those great vegetables and flowers. Adding compost to your soil each fall and even during the growing season is one of the best things you can do to help the overall health of your garden every single season. And learning how to make compost on your own is a great way to recycle that garden waste and save some money. Let's turn our attention now to somewhat of a moving target. Trends in the world of horticulture can sometimes be like fashion. One minute you're in, the next one you're out. 
There are a few items that we can look forward to, and that's the topic of this week's landscape lesson. Our greenhouse is a great place to talk about some of the gardening trends for 2017 because it's all about growing food indoors and flowers and herbs and the kinds of things that millennials and other gardeners want to be able to use in their own food and for their own families. That brings in another trend which is clean and of course local. Knowing your sources, knowing what has gone into what you are either going to eat or use uh, on your table or for decoration or let your children play in. So less use of chemicals, of course, which is another thing that we espouse on Backyard Farmer and Lifestyle Gardening. There is a trend toward something called buzz off, which actually means let's not use all of those strange insect repellents. Instead, let's let the bats and the birds take their fill of all that luscious protein. And of course, our, our critter creature would say, don't use a bat house, but give those bats the other places that they would like to live. Uh, the trend toward natural materials is one that we really like. And of course, also local. Technology is really finding a place in trending in, in gardens in 2017, partly because so many millennials are also wanting to garden and taking great advantage of apps. Uh, indoor lighting is going to be big. Small spaces, of course, are big, if, if you will pardon the pun on that particular one, to do more in smaller spaces. That would include larger containers as opposed to a lot of small containers, putting shrubs in containers, and perhaps those shrubs have on them something that you can uh, pick and use in, in, in your kitchen or in your brewing if you're into that kind of thing as well. Color blocking is going to be a fun one this year. Lots of color in big sweeps and masses. We're seeing also a trend toward gold in the landscape, and that may in fact be one that, that transcends just 2017. Gold in the landscape means that a gray day gets brightened. So we're seeing that in furniture, we're seeing that in plant material. Enjoy the trends, pick off the ones that you want in your own landscape, and remember that trends are just that. Pick the ones that work for you. Exploring new ideas and being open to trying some of those new trends are part of having fun with your gardening hobby. Each new spring gives you a chance to be a little adventurous. Of course, you can always find new challenges or trends on your favorite gardening programs, websites, and even in the seed catalogs. Nebraska is known for many things, corn, livestock, and our beloved Huskers among them. We're also one of the last places to retain a great and wonderful part of native prairie. However, cedar trees are becoming a really serious problem in some parts of our state, and what is still planted as a hardy tree for windbreaks is now a threat to take over some of our precious prairies. We recently talked to University Agronomy Professor Dirac Twidwell about this problem and what we can do to help control it. I'm really happy to have Dirac Twidwell with me today to talk about one of our favorite trees that we use for windbreaks in the state of Nebraska. Dirac, we're having all sorts of issues with the windbreaks in the state of Nebraska and the Plains states. We've lost the pines to things like pine wilt. We have spruce that are going down from drought or age or the combination of things. So cedars are really sort of our go-to evergreen for windbreaks. But what is up with the cedars? So there's a growing concern about cedar, simply because as it spreads into environments where it formerly was absent or where it was rare, we've started to see a lot of changes of things we value from our grasslands and our forests uh, that are more native. And so that's where a lot of the concern's growing and why it's being called an invasive species. Cedars are a native plant, but if we attach the word potentially invasive or invasive, just exactly how are they spreading and what is the impact of that spread into bike path areas, city areas, waste areas, rangeland, pasture? I think it's a, it's a real point of confusion amongst what makes a species invasive. And for scientists, invasion is a biological process that's not about its political origin. And so that's where that confusion comes from. Um, cedar, there's lots of areas in Nebraska where it wasn't at before. No different than a species coming from China and uh, like Chinese tallow tree in the southeast. It just had much less distance in order to travel to go to areas where it wasn't before. But it has the same types of 
biological invasion pathways that make a species invasive. It starts out and as it goes into new areas, you see this lag and slow growth phase. And so it takes a long time for invasive species to become established before you see this threshold and this rapid increase in their abundance. And so you actually get normalized to it, you get used to it in these areas, and you don't think it's going to be a problem. And then all invasive species go through this logistic growth function or this big rapid increase. And that's what we're seeing with cedar. So how exactly are you going about helping people try to figure out why they need to control and how to actually control both the existing ones and the spread of future cedar invasions? Yeah, so the first question that everyone has is how do we control them? And there's no state that across broad, expansive landscapes has stopped the spread of cedar. And once it gets established, it's so expensive with how we want to try and control it that no state has reversed it across big landscapes. So everybody wants to try and control it. One of the reasons we think that we've failed in multiple areas is simply because you can't just use control methods if the seed source keeps coming. It's kind of like controlling dandelions on your property and your neighbor has dandelions next to it. You're going to have a dandelion problem. Same things with cedar, just on big landscapes the size of a state. Now, people are using a lot of techniques to control it. The biggest challenge is how do we manage across big enough areas? So prescribed fire is a big method, and we know that one works because Plains Indians used it for thousands of years to keep cedar in areas where it couldn't spread. Um, haying really is something that people don't think of when they're managing cedar, but you're constantly keeping it out because as it's just sprouting, you're cutting it off at the base and so it can't get big. Um, and so those are two of the biggest prevention methods. When you start seeing cedar, that's when we say you have a problem, right, as soon as you can see it. So people use hand shears, axes, you know, cut it off that way. If it gets really big, then you're talking about more big mechanical equipment. Uh, in the Southern Plains, it's a million dollars to do a thousand acres. That's why we can't get it restored to what we want. It's so expensive. Um, so those are the big ones, but we want to try and learn to avoid the real expensive rest restoration type practices and go towards more prevention. You know, homeowners and small commercial businesses and cities have used cultivars and varieties of cedars or junipers for eons, and there's some pretty great ones on the market. Do we need to be concerned about whether they are going to begin producing seed and short of the straight species seeding itself about in native or natural landscapes, they're actually going to become a problem in managed landscapes? What do we look for there? Yeah, I think it's a great question and that's what we're trying to, to just get people to think about more. Um, we haven't really paid attention, um, we haven't really paid attention in any state of how much should we be focusing on our seed propagation, these horticultural techniques we're using in our backyards, and we're acting like we can plant them there and they won't spread, and they, they spread. So should we start looking at how we're planting, how we're selecting for certain traits, where we're actually uh, spreading cedar ourselves, um, and just starting to ask those questions. I think our biggest message is that people need to start focusing in more on this is something that's a problem, and how are we contributing to it already? And the seed source is one of our biggest issues. So that way we're not just throwing it on other people and saying, you just need to control it, it's your problem. We're contributing to that on our neighbor's properties. So how can we do a better job of getting ahead of it? So I'm not really sure that anybody is actually going to like the answer that you gave them, but what I'm hearing <laughs> is that we should be cautionary. We should take a, a peek at or take a real good look at what we are purchasing for use in our own home landscapes or on the farms and keep posted with all the great information that you are going to provide for us. Is that correct? <laughs> sure, yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> Solutions to the issue of cedars can be tricky and really expensive. For homeowners, a good place to start is to remember planting a diversity of trees and shrubs will make not only your surroundings more beautiful and interesting, but will go a long way towards solving some of these bigger issues. Okay, let's take a few minutes now to answer our viewer emails. We'd really love to hear from you. Share a picture or two with us by sending us an email, byf at unl.edu. Our first question comes from an Omaha viewer and they happen to be out in their landscape in spite of the cold weather, looking at their ewes, which are well established, they noticed all these little yellow dots kind of toward the end of the newer growth. 
sort of right at the point where the needles attach to the main twig. Their concern on this is, first off, they've never noticed this before, which may in fact mean that they simply haven't been looking at this time of year. And of course, the second question or concern associated with that is they wonder whether this is the egg casing of an insect, is this the start of some disease that they simply haven't noticed, what is that? Well, the good news is that is actually just something those ewes are supposed to do. Those are actually the flower buds. So when spring finally breaks, what will happen is those buds will also pop open, very small little puffs of of yellowish flowers that to most people don't even look like flowers. They almost look like a little tiny dinky uh, dish brush. And of course, then the pollen is released and they are finished uh, doing their thing for the season. So that is absolutely nothing to worry about. Our second question comes from York. This is a viewer who has a well-established, older but not ancient, not those toothpick pines, but some older pines, Ponderosa and Austrian in particular, and of course, they've heard us talk on Backyard Farmer about a lot of the different diseases that we're seeing in our pines. What they are seeing currently is this really strange distorted tips at the very ends of last year's growth that could indeed be the remains of diseases from last season. They're also, however, seeing some completely dead branches with all of the needles, whether it's first year growth, second year growth, back two or three feet, that are just brown as anything and still hanging in the tree. And they're wondering if that is also disease or is that in fact some sort of an injury? Well, the first one is likely disease. And of course, as we get into Backyard Farmer, we'll talk about what you can do about that and when. We have some great video on YouTube about that. The second one is probably highly likely to simply be wind damage. It could be actually also a spot where maybe a hailstone hit and hit just right in that location, snap that twig, a squirrel or an opossum or, or a big old bird got on that branch and snapped it off. Could also have been some chipping or some chewing by squirrels uh, going around and girdling that limb. So realistically, that is something that if they're low enough down, you can get up and, and get that out of there. Uh, keep your feet on the ground and don't use a chainsaw over your head, of course, but get those, those dead branches out of that tree uh, when you can and then pay attention later in the season to what needs to be done to manage the needle diseases on those pines. For our final feature today, we're going to return to the topic of hops. Nebraska Extension has been working on new research on how breeding and growing hops in our state could lead to a profitable crop for farmers and to locally sourced ingredients for craft brewers. So something that's of interest to me is, is searching uh, high value specialty crops that have a potential to be grown in Nebraska. Um, this particular project that we're working on is uh, looking at hops as a potential specialty crop. Um, there's a lot of interest in it right now, especially with the microbrewers that are going on. And um, people are kind of just starting hops without really knowing any baseline. So this project was basically set up just to evaluate the relative success of hops in Nebraska. We're gonna do some qualitative analysis, so how good is the hops on an annual basis, which is critical for the, the microbrewers in order to, to know whether or not they're gonna have similar product from year to year. As well as we wanna get an idea of what the productivity is going to be. Um, Nebraska's environment is quite volatile, um, so we're just wanting to see how, how good it will be from year to year. Some of the things that we're looking at is we're just growing it across a variety of areas in Nebraska. Um, the hops production mainly is on the eastern side of the state right now because of the microclimates that they find along the Missouri River Valley. But we want to see how well it would be out in the exposed areas. One of the problems with hops is it's uh, relative um, problems with some different types of diseases. And one of the benefits we might have in Nebraska is, is a lot of air movement. Uh, which will prevent disease problems, but on the other hand, it might cause some problems with the quality of, of the cones themselves. So with the project, we have four different sites that we're looking at, um, wanting to compare elevations, um, exposure, and the types of soils that we have uh, in, in, in the areas. 
Uh, a lot of the hops that are grown were originally developed in the Pacific Northwest, and so they have a lot of adaptation traits and pest tolerance to things that are important in that growing environment. And those varieties don't necessarily perform very well in our region. And so my goal with our breeding program is to try and take some of the brewing quality characteristics of those Pacific Northwest varieties and incorporate some of our local, locally adapted or native germplasm. So, so we have some hops that are believed to have fallen off of trains several hundred years ago uh, as trains migrated across the U.S. And the, as the seeds fell off the trains, they germinated, established local populations of hops. And so the thought is that those hop varieties those local wild varieties tend to have more or better adaptation traits and so they may have uh, pest tolerance and abiotic stress tolerance that's really important to growing hops in our region. So the idea of the breeding program is really to combine those adaptation traits with the brewing quality traits of the commercial varieties and see if we can't combine those into something that performs well here for our, our local brewers. So this project is a three-year project but ultimately we want to see the relative success of hops in Nebraska and whether that there is a commercial viability to it uh, or if it's just going to be mainly just a specialty crop for small growers. We've had one season of research, preparation, planting, growing and harvesting our hops. We had some successes, we learned a lot, we still have a long ways to go. Hopefully someday soon you'll be able to enjoy a frosty brew made with Nebraska-grown barley, wheat, and hops. And that's our program for this week. Next time we'll be featuring an underground sprinkler system at Raising Nebraska in Grand Island. We'll talk about the importance of home soil testing, and we'll see how a local nursery handles plants in the wintertime. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So good afternoon, good gardening, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening.